Good morning. It's good to see you guys. I realize it is not sunshiny. Flowers aren't doing anything you want them to do today, but I saw a lot of birds this morning. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I saw a lot of birds this morning and I enjoyed it. Um, if you can just let all of these concerns, and I'm sure you have them, if you can allow your concerns to just go for a moment. And if you could uh, stand, if you can do so without pain, and sing with us to the God of creation, worshiping the God of creation. Uh, the first song we're going to sing is called Above All. It's above all power, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. Above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were there before the world began. I want you to think about those words. Because whatever you've got that's bothering you, and I know you do, I'm sure of it, because we're all existing in the same world together, and I know something has got to be bothering you. But whatever that is, I want to assure you that God is still on his throne, and he is aware of what's happening. Above all power. Thought of me 
Uh, this next song starts with the line, Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed.
the last song we're going to sing um, is Sanctuary. And we're going to try to sing all the verses, which are still new to me, so I'm sure they're still new to you. Though I'm sure they're not new. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a God, I thank you for the group that has assembled this morning. I thank you for those that weren't able to come. Father God, I pray that you would bless us, that you would lead us forward in unity. I pray that you would help us to love one another, that we could draw closer to one another and closer to you, to bring glory to your name. I pray you'd be with the rest of the service in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you sit down, if you could please... Make some eye contact, give a hug, handshake, high five, whatever you deem appropriate.
Good morning. So I think my favorite part of this screen is the fact that Dylan has to come all the way up on the stage to, to adjust it. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses and who trust in multitudes of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. That is Isaiah 31.1. Today, uh, we're still going through the Confession of Faith in a Mennonite Perspective, 1995. Again, that's the publication year, not the price. I think they run at about seven ninety eight at the moment. Or you can come take one from the office. I have a few extras. Uh, but we're getting near the end uh, of the Confession of Faith in a Mennonite perspective. And oddly enough, there's probably been a few Sundays I could have deviated from this plan. Um, because maybe... Maybe the article was actually either not related enough to what's going on or too close to home to what's going on. But I really felt like I should just stay the course. And I think God will bless me for it. And hopefully he'll bless you for it as well. Because believe it or not, it's not all about me. It's taken a long time to realize that, but it becomes clearer every day that this really isn't about me. So we are on an article that I've actually preached about twice before. And since I've only been the pastor here for, what, a year and a half, that's a lot of times. Uh, which is peace, justice, and non-resistance. And of course, this is a position that's very dear to my heart. In fact, it's um, one of the biggest reasons why I am a Mennonite as opposed to something else. And then actually the biggest reason, aside from I feel like God wants me here, is believe it or not, you people are why I'm a Mennonite. Because I love you people. Not because you're perfect, because we're not. Not because we always get along, because unfortunately, no, we don't. But there's something about people trying to live in community and trying to pursue Jesus as the Prince of Peace that actually absolutely warms my soul. So that's why I'm here. Sometime during this week, I would like you to reflect on why are you here? I believe you belong here. Don't talk yourself out of being here. But I want you to think about why are you here? Right? For some of you, it's a lot easier. You'd be like, well, my mom brought me. And if you're a kid, you kind of have an out on this one. <laughs> or if you're married, and you're like, she makes me come. Well, then that's why you're here is because you love your spouse. There's worse reasons to be at church in the morning than because you're honoring your marriage. But I think um, one of the things that keeps resonating truer and truer to me every day is the areas of my life where I still lack intentionality. I want to know that everything I'm doing has a purpose because we all have the same few hours to our day. How many of you have too much time to work with? Any hands? Who is struggling with having too much time? Okay. I haven't been bored in years. But with the few hours that we all share, because we all have 24 hours, we stuff them full of everything under the sun. Obligations things that we feel we should do, things that need done and no one else seems willing to do. And that's good to a point. But I want everything to have an intention up to 
and maybe even particularly, what am I going to church for this morning? Now, some of you could say, I'm going to church to get fed, which is a Christian saying, I'm going to church to learn about God. And hopefully I can do that for you. Not a bad reason to come to church. Right? Other people could be very clear and just say, someone invited me. Great. Welcome. Thank you. That's awesome. We want you here so much. But I think the greater thing that we should all have in common, regardless of whatever our, our goal is here personally, is that this is time that we set aside to corporately, and I know that's a scary word because corporation bad, but corporately as a group to uplift and glorify God because he deserves it. On my worst day, God still deserves to be glorified. God deserves to be praised. And that's what we're doing together. That's, that's the goal together. If you are being fed, yes, that's great. If you get to see the people that you missed all week, that's wonderful. If it makes you feel closer to God, that's phenomenal. But we're here to glorify God this morning. That is also something that we need to have as a, as a goal for all of us. All right, so I'm actually speaking about peace, justice, non-resistance. These are really important to me, believe it or not. These are in incredibly important to me because I have a history of, well, when I say it like that, it makes me sound a little more awful than I want it to, but I have a history of violence. I really do to the point where I, I truly believed for much of my existence that violence was always part of the solution. I really disagree with that point now. Because I don't see any good that has come out of any of it. I also believe that modeled for us very clearly in Scripture is that Jesus, the Prince of Peace, went to death as a lamb before the slaughter, right? He didn't fight back. Something you notice about all of his disciples as they're being martyred, they didn't fight back. Doesn't that strike you as weird? But in the upside-down kingdom that we're called to live in, there's virtue in laying down your life to stand for truth, to stand to show others. And I don't think I can emphasize that enough. Oddly enough for me, learning to be peaceable is a lot harder than just not punching someone in the face. And I know that makes me unique. But believe it or not, to learn not to punch somebody in the face is an acquired skill for some of us. Learning instead to love someone who at one point you would have been trying to figure out the best way to choke them is an entirely different thing. But that is actually what God is calling us to is to love our enemies. It can be a little tedious. But I'm going to start in Isaiah 2, verse 2. And this is, uh, in my Bible, it, this section is actually titled, The Future House of God. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares 
and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. In scripture, when we look forward to a house of the Lord, God is judging in between us. People aren't making war anymore to the point where they have uh, reappropriated their weapons. They've beat their, oh goodness, going back to verse 4, they beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I'm a huge fan of the Old Testament, and I can tell you, in the Old Testament, God had a chosen people and a holy nation, or they were supposed to be. And by my estimation, that's what it would take to have a just war, is when God is truly on your side and God is truly making the decisions. So I believe in history there was just war. I also don't believe that, I love this country, please don't mishear me. I do not believe that we are God's holy nation. This is a really great place to live, and I thank God I'm here. But we're not a holy nation unto God. We don't get cues from God to go in and smite our enemies and obliterate them. And if we need to talk about that after the service, I might not have time today, actually, but please make time to yell at me about that if you need to. I will take it. I spent 13 months in a desert being shot at for I don't know why. And that's the reason, because I don't know why. I've watched people die in the sand. I don't like it. I've watched the rich get richer, and I've watched the poor kids die. I love this country. My servicemen are my brothers. I love them. I'm not speaking against them. But what I'm saying, we follow the Prince of Peace. It's part of my discipleship and sanctification and following the Prince of Peace. I commit myself to living as peaceful as I can. I want to be a peacemaker. And if you talk to me in private, you'll also realize how much I wish I owned a peacemaker because the irony is I'm actually a gun nut. I love them. They're neat. There's a lot of science that goes into a gun. I used to hunt. I could say that's why I own them. You know what's funny? I'm completely gun shy. I'm serious. I'm completely gun shy at this point in my life. My biggest goal in my therapy at the VA hospital is that I can hunt again. Because guns, the sound scares me. Fireworks scare me. But I'm also a history nut. And I know I have the right to own guns and I love the idea, so I keep them in a safe. (laughs) But I love them. Not as much as I love you people. They're objects, they're not important. They're gonna rust and corrode one day. I actually don't believe that they're protecting me from any enemy, foreign and domestic. I have a pit bull for that. No, I'm kidding. My pit bull will lick you to death. Um, Because if I can redirect you to our welcome verse, this is one of the biggest trappings I feel that we have as Christians. Because we live in a world, and we actually live in a really great place, despite all the issues and Boy, do we have some. We live in a fantastic place. And if you live in this country, God has blessed you. God has blessed you so much. But something that we always need to keep in mind is from Isaiah 31. Oh, where we go? Um, I'll just read the whole thing instead of cherry picking half a verse. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in multitudes for their chariots, in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or to seek help from the Lord. Some of you already know how you're voting next election. Some already know a multitude of things 
about what we're going to do, right? Or what we should do. Or why aren't the Marines in, what's that place? The Ukraine right now, or anything like that. We have those opinions. We have those questions. We have all that because you're a thinking human being as God made you. But what really should always be forefront in our minds is who are we trusting on? Who are we relying on for our strength and our salvation? Are we trusting in horses and chariots or the modern equivalent? If you've never seen anyone fire a one, nine or eight cannon, it's a thing of mass destruction. It'd be easy to trust in the strength of field artillery. It's impressive. But that's not what we're supposed to rely on. For those of you who have never seen a helicopter light up a hillside, it's a thing of power. It's, it's impressive. But we're not supposed to rely on that either. I hope that as a church that we're able to rely on God because as we're reading through scripture together and as we're reading through the most confusing book in the Bible, well, one of the top three conf most confusing books in the Bible, which is Revelation, the thing that becomes clearer to me every chapter, God is on the throne. He is not unaware of our circumstances. God is still being glorified in heaven. He's not turning a blind eye to our troubles. That is one of the only things that gets clearer to me as I read Revelation, is that all of this is happening. God is still on his throne. He's still in charge. That will not cease to be. We can rely on God. Which if you're ever in a if you're ever in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, they even have a little uh, frozen yogurt place, frog yogurt, fully rely on God. It's a very sweet concept. I'm working for the pun. It's just not falling. Okay. It's a neat little shop, though. The next place I'm going to go to is a section of verses that I struggle with immensely, personally. And most of you do too, whether or not you're aware of it. I struggle with it immensely. But I'm going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. And even the title just grates me. But you know who's at fault here? When I argue with scripture, guess who loses? Me. Because I need to conform myself to the mind of God. I don't need to change scripture to fit what I feel. We live by faith, not by feeling. God gave you your emotions. They're a blessing. Don't ignore them, but we live by faith, not by feeling. I feel this is unnecessary. No, I don't. This is necessary. I also don't like it. I don't like it. I can look in the mirror and say, too bad. I need to learn to love it. Therefore, submit, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or the governors or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of the evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you may put silent or you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free yet not using <laughs> yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice but as a bond servant of god honor all people love the brotherhood fear god honor the king does anyone else have issues with that Honoring 
the king. I know we don't have a king. Does anyone else have difficulty with that? Granted, our leaders change pretty frequently, yet we're still playing the same game. Do we pray for those who lead us? Now, the loophole I used to give myself that is, well, our government's pretty bad, right? That was the loophole I used to give myself. The scripture also tells us to pray for those who persecute us. Bless those who persecute you and despisefully use you. In fact, so far, scripture has told me to love my neighbor, love my enemy, love a foreigner, love a sojourner. Who does that leave out? No one. That leaves out no one. So as much as I may disapprove of the job someone is doing, I'm still supposed to be praying for them. I'm still supposed to be praying that God would lead them. Because I know how we tend to pray in Christian circles about leaders we don't like. It's easier to pray, dear God, get this person out of office or get this person out of their job. Or Do we pray that God would use them? That God would change them? Do we have the awareness that Jesus died for that person? Do we have the awareness, and I'm quoting Boyd, so this is an original thought, that you will never look into the eyes of someone that Jesus wasn't willing to die for? Do we have that awareness when we're thinking of our leaders? Do we have that awareness when we're thinking about our enemies? That's actually going to take retraining your neural pathways, by the way. Your brain isn't going to do that naturally. But if you could see the person that you're judging, because we do it, we do it. The next time you're going by the park and you see the person who's clearly dealing with addictions, with the bad hygiene and the missing teeth and all that, Try to take a second to realize that you are not God's favorite child. That the Father loves that child so much. That our hearts should be breaking when we're stepping over homeless people. But do they? I know for myself, I have a tendency to look at a list of people's sins of how they got there. Well, yeah, they did. Now what? Loving people, blessing people, helping people should not come with an application that they have to fill out. Our call to love people doesn't change based on their track record. Because who among us deserves to go to heaven? I need to put that rock back up here too. We have a rock that goes on the table that says, He who is without sin can cast the first stone. I'm a sinner. I've been redeemed. I am being sanctified and it hurts. I don't get to throw stones. I don't get to throw stones at people. Because I've probably either done it, thought about doing it, or did something equivalent. My only moral high ground in this world is I've never hurt a child. That's it. That's it. But with my understanding now, 
when do people stop being children before God? They don't. So my little worldly moral high ground there that I had and was so proud of might not be that true. I've heard a lot of adults. I would love to think there'll be some point when I stop breaking the heart of my father. That's the goal, though, isn't it? Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump back to Matthew 5. Now, um, I'm actually going in two different sections in Matthew 5. And I'm fully convinced that we could camp out in Matthew 5 for a year and talk about something different each time. Matthew 5 is so full, it's so rich, it's got so many teachings of Christ just all together right there. If you're short on time but want to draw closer to God, read Matthew 5 over and over and over again and be surprised at how much stuff you see for the first time. But I'm actually going to start in verse 21, and I'm only going to go to 26, and then I'm going to jump over to 43. Not because the rest isn't important, but because I actually used some of the rest of this two weeks ago. Murder begins in your heart. You have heard it, excuse me, <clears throat> you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in the danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in the danger of hellfire. Now, Raka doesn't translate into English. Some translations say something else, just trying to approximate it in English. So you can't translate the word Raka, but if there's a mean thing you could say about anybody, that's what it means. And I remember in Pashtun, uh, there was a word just like it that did not translate to English because it didn't have a tra direct translation. But I was told, think of the worst thing you could say to somebody. That's what it means. And I can't remember it, thankfully. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on your way with him lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. What I get from that section of Scripture is that sin begins in your heart. In fact, we find that throughout the Gospels. That sin begins in your heart. Now, if you've thought of hurting someone, you've committed the sin. Now, that doesn't mean just go ahead and hit them or go ahead and kill that person because you've already committed the sin. There's a ripple effect to action to which one sin becomes many sins. But we shouldn't deceive ourselves into thinking that we're not killers. When was the last time you were angry with someone Think about it. When was the last time you were angry with somebody? Well, it's church day, and since everyone moves at their own speed, I guarantee you a lot of you were angry with someone this morning. How many of you have neighbors that are on a different schedule than you? Probably wasn't that long ago you were angry with them. There was fireworks last night. It puts me in a weird mood. I don't like them. I was angry with people that night. Maybe that was the night before last. It all runs together. Night before last, there was fireworks. I don't like them. I don't like them at all. 
In fact, that's one of the best things about uh, dog ownership is we can just kind of sit there and hold each other and shake until it stops. It's awesome. Life is better with dogs. But it made me angry. People celebrating made me angry. That's silly. And I know that up here. It's silly for me to get angry about that. There's such a thing as righteous anger, I just know I don't do it very often or for very long. I've been righteously angry. Within five seconds, it turns into child petulance. It really does. I wish they knew what they were doing. They're sinning. I wish they knew that. Don't they know what I've done for them? It's that quick. It's that quick. I'm speaking personally, too. Some of you are probably capable of righteous anger. And I've had it in in waves. Jesus modeled righteous anger. He did at the temple. He, He modeled righteous anger. If you listen to Jesus proclaim woes, those aren't sweet. I have a stinking suspicion that he wasn't just standing on a hillside using that British accent that Jesus always has on the film. Going, woe to you. I don't think that was what was happening. He was proclaiming something very serious. He might have been a little upset. But what Jesus modeled in righteous anger, I am not capable of emulating. Not for more than maybe five seconds. After that, I really need to start seeking God for myself. Because righteous anger allowed me to see an injustice or an inconsistency. My pride is going to take over from there. Verse 43, I'm still in Matthew 5. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those that love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. It is not easy to love people you disagree with. It is not easy to love people who lie to you. It is not easy to love people who spitefully use you. Someone hit me with a saying a couple years ago that I actually found slightly therapeutic. Um, They told me, in order for someone to use you, you have to be useful so that I should just take the compliment. (laughs) Oddly enough, I found that very helpful. So there is a slight compliment in people using you, because in order to be used, you have to be useful. I would rather just have somebody say, hey, appreciate you. It's a way better compliment. I saw what you did there. Good job. I know I've kind of kind of gone a little more on the fringes of the subject than I was intending to, but like I said, I've spoke on this a lot, and I probably will continue to. And I've also mentioned justice a lot in the past, too, about how justice is n- not in need of any extra adjectives, actually. To do justice is to do what is right before God. It's to do what is right before God. Can we strive for justice and not have to break it down into sections? Because the second you start adding adjectives, it becomes harder to follow your thinking. 
it becomes harder to distinguish what is true justice and what is economic justice and what is social justice and what is criminal justice and what is justice. To do justice is the will of God. To do injustice is a sin. Life is a very gray area, I am aware. So sometimes that's going to be harder to sort out, but I really don't like false divisions. Justice is the will of God. Injustice is a sin. It's that simple. To me. To me it's that simple. And again... You're allowed to disagree with me, but now why? You're allowed to question what I say. It's okay. I am not infallible. I'm not even good. What I'm hoping I'm doing, though, is transmitting to you Transmitting, I sound like a radio person. What I hope I'm doing, though, is just transferring to you what I'm reading from divinely inspired, perfect word of God. That's what I'm hoping I'm doing. If too much of my personality, if too much of my flaws or too much of my opinions is what you're hearing, challenge it. Reread everything that I've said. And I would welcome you to correct me if you feel you need to. Because that's how I'm going to grow. Closer to my God. Because growth always is... You get growing pains, you know? You get growing pains. Self-comfort is a bad thing in a spiritual walk. If you are comfortable, you are not growing. Growth has pain. Anyhow, that's what I have for this morning. If you can do so without pain, could you please stand with me?